Okay, gang. Let's, like, split up and search for clues. Scoop and I will go this way. Right, go on, Scoop. Okay. They stole my thing that I say. Jinkies, and welcome to a pop culture look in the movies. I'm Azza the Pop Culture Viking, and today we're going to be looking at the sequel to one of the most popular live action movies, Scooby Doo 2 Monsters Unleash. Now, look, I've already talked about Scooby Doo, so it definitely doesn't feel right if I don't talk about the sequel. And today we're going to be looking into its history, its pop culture impact, and its spot in cinema. <laughs> Now before we get started guys, if you do like videos like this, don't forget to hit that notification button, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and if you're just joining us, feel free to click here to see our previous videos, and if there's a movie that you guys would like for me to cover, feel free to comment down below, and with that being said, and with spoilers ahead, let's get into it. Now while the first movie was panned by critics, Scooby-Doo was very successful for Warner Brothers, where the film earned around $275 million off an $84 million budget. And thanks to the popularity of Scooby-Doo from the fandom of kids, or that one adult that grew up with it in the 70s, in June of 2002, at the time of the release of Scooby-Doo, Dan Filman, the president of Warner Brothers, confirmed that a sequel was in the works and was slated for a 2004 release. In March of 2003, it was announced that Freddie Prince Jr., Sarah Michelle Gellar, Neil Fanning, Matthew Lillard, and Linda Cardellini would reprise their roles in the sequel. Filming for the sequel began on April 14th, 2003 in Vancouver. And along with director Raja Gosnell returning and writer James Gunn returning, who had just written for Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead film, which I'd love to do a video on, who would then go on to make his directorial debut with the movie Slither and make his big break with Guardians of the Galaxy. Such a random career going from Scooby-Doo to horror to superhero films. Okay, now the Warner Brothers were jumping ahead with the sequel and with the cast returning, there was still plenty of room for some new faces. We'll start with Seth Green as Patrick, the Criminology Museum owner, which is a nice little Buffy the Vampire Slayer reunion with Seth and Sarah. Everybody loves Raymond's dad Peter Boyle as Old Man Wickles, who was the very first villain in the first ever Scooby-Doo episode as the Black Knight Ghost. And Michael Rooker was originally meant to play the role of Old Man Wickles and then later becomes a James Gunn regular. We get Tim Blake Nelson as Dr. Jonathan Jacobo, whose villain origins were changed as a bank robber as his cartoon character counterpart was smuggling pirated music. It's a cartoon from the 70s, what can you do? And Alicia Silverstone as reporter Heather Jasper Howe. Set designs were made to keep the feel of the original cartoon while giving it a modern look. Production designer Bill Bowes used the cartoon art style as a visual of the set while using shadows to inspire most of the Scooby-Doo 2 sets. Now this is the first time that we've seen a live action Coolsville which is the Scooby-Doo gang's hometown so we get to see multiple locations like the old mining town which was a real mine but turned into a mining museum which had been labelled by the creators as the most important location in the film. The Coolzonian Criminology Museum which was shot at the Vancouver Art Gallery which they set up for the costume displays for the Scooby-Doo villain exhibition. And made it look like an actual exhibit with real plaques that they got the information off from the internet. As with the built sets, we get the Mystery Inc. headquarters, Old Man Wickle's Mansion, which was the cast and crew's favourite set, the clubhouse, which was filled with Scooby-Doo Easter eggs, and the Mining Town Underground Lab, which is separate from the Mining Town location. The stunts got a bit of an upgrade too, as stunt coordinator JJ Marcaro and fight choreographer James Banford were brought on board. Now for the set of Scooby-Doo 2, everyone was allowed to do most of their own stunts. Sarah Michelle Gellar has a memorable fight scene with the Black Knight Ghost where she said that she loved doing her own stunts and was also praised for her work on the set thanks to her previous role in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show. Bit of an upgrade from fighting a pro wrestler to a supernatural ghost wielding the biggest sword in the world that Ned Stark would be proud of. Freddie Prince Jr. was the most excited to do his stunts, especially for the motorbike jousting scene as he had motorcycle experience before. Matthew Lillard and Seth Green kept fit in order to work with the stunt team where Matthew Lillard got to do a lot of wire work for the film. And Seth's Green character was written as a clumsy person where Seth had to learn how to properly trip fall, which he said was the hardest to do as he had to be funny but also make it look realistic. Linda Cardellini did take the opportunity to do her own stunts, but any of the riskiest stunts, she had a stunt double on standby, where there's behind the scenes footage of the stunt double teaching Linda how to fall. Okay, so now that we've got some new faces in the sequel, some new set designs and some new stunt work, now it was time to bring the monsters to life. Peter Crossman, who worked on the visual effects on the previous film, returned to work on the special effects for the sequel. Now while the look and behaviour of Scooby-Doo got a bit of an upgrade to make him more realistic for the sequel, the special effects team were tasked to bring the classic Scooby-Doo monsters to life. For the Skeleton Men, when they were created, they were just eyeballs, which is bloody nightmare fuel for kids, but the team thought it would be funnier to add mouths so they can communicate in their own language, and both of them having different personalities, where the one with the red eye is the smart one, while the one with the green eye is the more stupid one. The Black Knight Ghost was a mix of 
practical costume design and CGI, especially with the torso missing to give the illusion that it's just a walking night suit. Captain Cutler's Ghost, Minor 49er and the Zombie were massive costumes with CGI green smoke surrounding them. Now while the 10,000 Volt Ghost and the Tar Monster were obvious CGI, the Tar Monster was actually the most expensive monster to make for the film, as the Tar Effect was the most expensive to animate. At one point it was considered to just cut the Tar Monster entirely because of how expensive it was, but the production decided against that. Now there were some monsters that were going to be added into the film, but got cut due to how much it would have cost for the makeup and the costume. And the film was pretty overloaded with Scooby-Doo monsters at this point anyway. And there were other monsters written for the film, like Phantom Shadow and Spooky Space Kook, but veteran creator and makeup effects artist Steve Johnson was hired to create the monsters for the film. His team designed and did test screenings for most of the monsters until production decided not to feature some of the monsters and assigned a Vancouver base effects shop instead. Now while the Minor 49er design made it to the film, some of the monsters that Johnson's team did were screen tested but didn't get used like the Creeper and the Ghost of Redbeard. And some of these designs look f***ing terrifying. Like look at Ghost Clown, f***ing hell to the know if I saw that when I was 10 years old. But some of the designs that were made were used as the displays for the museum scene which the Chickenstein design had the most screen time for like literally 10 seconds. And with everything all filmed and wrapped, the Scooby-Doo sequel was finally finished and ready to release. And with a release date of the 26th of March 2004, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed was brought to the big screen. But now let's look at the positives and the negatives of the film. Well, let's start with the negatives. Now, this one's a bit of a personal one for me, but I do find Alicia Silverstone's character very annoying and aggravating. Heather Jasper Howe at the grand opening of the new Coolzonian Criminology Museum. Which I know is the point of her character and we'll talk about the plot a bit later. Later, but just her smug look and her presence just really annoys me. Now this is a minor negative, but there's a couple of CGI shots that can be a little noticeable, especially for the tar monster. But once you see it, it is a little distracting. Now definitely the appeal of this film is different compared to the original. See, in the original, it does appeal more to an older generation, as it does have some adult jokes and references in it, as it was intended to be a PG-13 film. Where in Monsters Unleashed, it's definitely made more for kids with little to no adult jokes, which definitely explains why the first one is more beloved than the second one. But there are some jokes in the second one which are fine. Right in the round tables. Lastly, the songs don't hit like they do in the first film. So while we get a cameo from hip-hop group Big Bruvs playing in the villain bar known as the Fold Ghost, singing their song Thank You and New Flow, we also get songs from a couple of other artists like Simple Plan and 2 Unlimited. Now before you at me in the comments, I don't think the songs or the artists are actually bad. But the first Scooby-Doo had a theme of summertime vibes, Monsters Unleashed soundtrack just doesn't hit as good as the first one. But now let's look at the positives. Now previously on the Scooby-Doo 2002 episode, I did mention that the mystery in the film had a unique and interesting story, but that doesn't mean that there were moments in the film that ruined that mystery of that particular film. Where Monsters Unleashed definitely has a better story and mystery. Like the gang uncovering the truth about why there are monsters from their previous adventures becoming real and are controlled by a mysterious masked figure. What is going on with Patrick's behaviour? We get villains from previous Scooby-Doo cartoon episodes as suspects. The media turns the town against the Scooby-Doo Doo gang, and Scooby-Doo and Shaggy wanting to do their own crime solving to prove to the gang they are not useless. Which this scene is my favourite Scooby-Doo and Shaggy moment. I'm buff! <laughs> my god! So definitely the plot of the film is an improvement compared to the original film, and I'll add the twist that it turns out that a machine was used to bring the monsters to life that was run by Heather Jasper Howell as the mysterious masked figure. But it turns out that it was Dr. Jonathan Jacobo the whole time, when we were led to believe that he was dead the whole time. The stunt work is definitely an improvement. We've only gotten a couple of fight scenes at the end of the first film, while the rest of the film was just running and screaming and including one quad bike chase. But some of the fight scenes are definitely a standout, like Daphne versus the Black Knight Ghost while Velma is looking for the Black Knight Ghost's weakness. <laughs> the jousting scene with Fred and the Black Knight Ghost, explosions going off from the 10,000 Volt Ghost, <laughs> and Shaggy and Scooby-Doo getting flung by the Pterodactyl Ghost. Sorry. 
The cast is definitely solid as well. While we did get Isla Fisher and Rowan Atkinson, Isla was still an unknown at the time, and Rowan Atkinson was only famous for being Mr. Bean and Johnny English. Where we get people like Seth Green, who has been in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the voice of Chris Griffin from Family Guy, legendary actor Peter Boyle, who has starred in films like Taxi Driver, Alicia Silverstone, who has been in films like Clueless and Batman and Robin, and Tim Blake Nelson, who's been in Old Brother Where Art Thou and Minority Report. Like, kids won't care about what these actors have been in, but for the adults, there's a handful of talent in this film. Definitely a big positive is the updated CGI and special effects. Now, in the first film, the actors and actresses had to act to nothing for the first film, and I mean literally nothing, like no guy in a green suit or anything, except for the airport scene. Where Monsters Unleashed, on the other hand, used a mix of CGI and practical effects, which works much better for the film compared to the last one, where the monsters were just all CGI and were very clunky and janky, especially when they moved. Now, I'm a sucker for practical effects, and seeing the Black Knight, Captain Cutler, Minor 49er and the zombie on screen and not made with CGI it just makes this film a highlight. Now while the CGI is noticeable like I said before and I've said some scenes are a little distracting it also works with the charm and look of the film as the film does give it a bit of a cartoon feel. Okay so now that we covered as much as we could what about the overall story that we got for the film? Well the Mystery Ink gang are back where Scooby-Doo and the gang must save Coolsville from an attack from their past monsters brought to life by an evil masked figure. The gang are tasked to take down the mysterious masked figure while dealing with the media and investigating past villains. And lastly, what did fans and critics think of the film along with its box office merchandise and marketing? So you remember when critics didn't like the last film? Well they sure as shit hated this one even more, so I'll let Obi-Wan Kenobi take over. Oh, not good. Critics definitely didn't like the second installment with a Rotten Tomatoes score of 22%, but with an audience score of 41%, which is roughly the same as the last one. Now critics have said that this film was targeted more for younger kids compared to the first one, and felt everything going on in this film was full of goofy antics. Some some other critics have felt that it wasn't as funny as the last one, nothing inspiring, nothing ejectable, and that it's a film that's only made for kids who are on a sugar rush. Yeah, cause it's a kids film. You fucking drips. Surprisingly, everyone's favourite film critic Roger Ebert liked this one better by giving it a 2 out of 4 stars, but still didn't like the film. Now as for fans, they do love the sequel, with some saying that it's definitely a better film, but between the two movies, it does seem that the first film is the most popular and adored compared to the sequel, with the first one being more popular, while the second one is considered the more superior one. As for the box office, with a budget of 25 to 80 million dollars, god that's a bit of a gap, the film made 181.2 million dollars at the box office. Now while while the film did profit, it did make $90 million less than its predecessor. As for the marketing of merchandise, now have you noticed that one of your mates watched a copy of Scooby-Doo and said that they were craving KFC after watching it? But then you say to him, well, I watched the same movie, but I'm actually feeling like Burger King. Well, you're both right, as there are actually two different versions of Scooby-Doo with two different paid partners. Now, Burger King bought the US rights to promote the film and toys for the US region, while KFC bought the international rights to promote the film and toys for everywhere else around the world. Now, this was also due to the fact that the world had more access to KFC than Burger King. So the US had the Burger King toys and adverts, while countries like the UK and Australia had KFC adverts. And both companies sold completely different toys, so they they didn't just slap two different logos on the same toys. And there are versions where Shaggy is holding a Whopper or a chicken sandwich and name drops the fast food chain in the different versions. When you were vegetarian in the last movie, and Scooby-Doo can be seen with a cup with either the Burger King or KFC logo on it. Two games loosely following the plot of the film were released in 2004 to coincide with the film's release. A 3D point and click adventure on the PC and a 2D beat em up platformer on the Game Boy Advance. In both games, one ending could only be seen by entering a code displayed at the end of the film at the credits. The film was released on DVD and VHS on September 14, 2004, in both full screen and widescreen editions. The DVD included deleted scenes from the film's production and other special features such as two music videos and an interactive game. And on November 9, 2010, Warner Brothers released both the film's and its predecessor as a double feature as mentioned in the previous video. A soundtrack was released on March 23, 2004 and featured artists I mentioned earlier like Big Bruv, Simple Plan, Wild Cherry, New Rascals and Fatboy Slim. Now before before we wrap this up, let's talk about the planned sequel that was scheduled. Now, in October of 2002, Warner Brothers did approve production on a third film while filming took place for the second one. But after confirmation from Matthew Lillard and James Gunn that the third film was cancelled due to the second film not doing as well as the first film and critics not really loving both films. But James Gunn on Twitter did reveal the plot of the third film where the Mystery Inc. gang are hired by a town in Scotland who complain that they are being plagued by monsters, but we discover throughout the film the monsters are actually the victims. Scooby and Shaggy have to come to terms with their own prejudice and narrow belief systems. Um, right. 
but this also led the future live action films to go straight to DVD, with a reboot featuring a new cast called Scooby Doo The Mystery Begins that aired on Cartoon Network in 2009. Now looking back at Scooby Doo, there is no denying that the popularity of both films is still strong to this day. James Gunn stated that out of the two films, Monsters Unleashed was definitely the superior film, and now thanks to his start in Scooby Doo, James Gunn has now gone on to direct Marvel and DC films, and is now in charge of the new DCU for Warner Brothers. Matthew Lillard is still positive about the films, thanks to the fans and has gone on to star in other projects. As far as I've seen, Linda Cardellini hasn't said much about the Scooby-Doo films, but as far as I've seen at the time of recording, she hasn't really said anything negative about them. Sarah Michelle Gellar has been surprised about the recent resurgence of Scooby-Doo and feels positive about the films. Freddie Prince Jr. on the other hand, while he is grateful of his fans and loves his co-stars, and ended up marrying one of them, he has made a statement saying, while he thinks James Gunn is a great person and a creative director, Freddie felt that he couldn't work with Gunn again, as Gunn's style is definitely not for Freddie, and has taken a break from Hollywood for a while, as Warner Brothers actually wanted him to take a pay cut for the sequel, as he was paid the most out of the four actors, and Matthew, Linda, and Sarah asked for pay rises for the sequel, which he stated he didn't mind doing, and the actors do deserve the pay rises, but couldn't understand why why Warner Brothers could pay them what they wanted in the first place, as the first film made a lot of money. Now while Scooby-Doo wasn't received well by critics and didn't get the third film it deserves, Scooby-Doo has gone on to be one of the most popular live action movies based on a cartoon in years. And for a franchise that has been around since the late 60s, it's still a beloved franchise despite having some controversies recently. And some bad luck with the new animated film Scoob, thanks to the mixed reception and the COVID-19 pandemic. The first two Scooby-Doo films are perfect examples of a strong fan base that keeps the movies alive and with the help of the Scooby-Doo gang and Neil Fanning who voiced Scooby-Doo is still alive to this day thanks to the resurgence. I think it had something to do with the memes lately. The films definitely fit in a unique spot in cinema history, with future generations stumbling upon the weird, the wacky and the gassy world of Scooby-Doo. But that's all for today guys, let me know your thoughts on Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed and if you'd like to see more videos like this, feel free to hit that notification button, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and if there's a movie that you guys would like for me to cover, feel free to comment down below, and with that being said, I'm Azza the Pop Culture Viking, always love pop culture, and don't forget the smile. Miss Hoover, the movie's over! Down in front!